What is your view on the practice of Pure Land Buddhism? Example, the practice of chanting Amida, the Buddha's name, with the aim of reaching the Pure Land. Out of curiosity, um, did this question come online or? Uh, online with the <laughs> highest vote. <laughs> How many of you are familiar with the evolution, the history of the evolution of Buddhism? As Brother Tan had made a very powerful point, in my view, a very important and powerful point earlier, that where the Buddha taught the Dhamma, along the way, humans came along and started introducing their own understanding and their own ideas, their own interpretation of the Dhamma. And the result of which is, you, you may not be aware of this, but we're talking about just a couple of hundred of years after the Buddha's time, there were as many as 18 schools, at least 18 schools. In fact, if the school that said it, there were 18 schools, if they had done an uh, absolutely correct count of the number of schools, it might actually have hit 30. In other words, over time, men who couldn't understand the Dhamma began to take aspects of the Dhamma, aspects of the teaching, aspects of the Eightfold Path. Just take some parts of it and emphasize on that in a very big way. It is not that they were wrong, but it's that the teaching at the point when it was taken out of context, that was incomplete. Now we all know that the Eightfold Path is three parts. Panya, Sila, Samadhi. Panya is wisdom, sila is virtues, wholesomeness, morality, depending on how you want to translate that. Samadhi is the mind that's quiet, focused, equanimous. The entire path requires training in all three parts. But along the way, in the course of history, in the course of time, there could in different parts of India, there were people who understood it, perhaps incomplete. They began to emphasize certain parts of it. So this one about Pure Land on Mahayana Buddhism, the emphasis is karuna, compassion. Why do I say karuna as opposed to just blind chanting? Because there are many people in the world who may not have the same uh, capacity to appreciate the Dhamma at that deep level that some, had, some were emphasizing in the past. So Dhamma at a deep level, hard to understand. Make it simple, simple for everyone. We'll do it just like this. So huge emphasis in Pure Land is on Sadda. If you have, now it is not completely wrong. Let me explain this. Huh? Let, let me just explain this. Not completely wrong because if your mind is placed on a virtuous object, a virtuous, the Buddha is personification and embodiment of virtue. If your mind is put on the Buddha, you keep it focused on the purity, the virtues of the Buddha and say, I want to be like the Buddha. I will transform myself in every way to be like the Buddha. If you do that, and you know Buddha was compassionate, Buddha was patient, Buddha has no anger, Buddha has no craving, etc. You know that. And you emulate that. Then your mind, at the moment when you are emulating him, it's pure. It's pure. It's just that you don't stay pure. Because depending on the conditions, your mind slips away from focus on goodness and instead we revert to our old habits and old behavior so if if your mind had stayed pure and something happens to you, you had a stroke fatal one uh, had a stroke had a heart attack 
and you die at that moment, your mind is pure. It will lift to a heavenly rebirth, just like that. But the trouble for all of us and for most of us is that our mind doesn't stay pure, as I said. Our mind reverts to habits. And habits means angry, angry law, jealous, jealous law. You know, our mind gets into habitual mental states. When that happens, you are out of purity. You're out of pure land. So if you, if you hold the view that it's pure chanting, 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 and I'm fine. No, it doesn't work like that. It is not pure chanting, 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 and you're fine. It is keeping the mind virtuous. Keeping the mind kusala. And then you are fine. And it does not have to be a monotonous single syllabus, monosyllabus or a double syllabus, Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. It, it's, it, it need not be that. It can be on anything that is pure. If you reflect on the Dhamma and you say, the Dhamma, I want to follow the Dhamma, also can, also pure land. It, 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 it serves the same function. You understand what I'm saying? Does that kind of answer the question? Would Brother Tan want to add on? Thank you for the question. I think uh, the, the rising of the many other schools of Buddhism, as uh, Sister Sylvia Bay mentioned, came uh, much later when uh, some Buddhists thought it would be very difficult at the later stage when the Buddha, the personification of the Dhamma, the teacher himself slow not, was no longer around. So it would be very difficult for the majority of people to really get clarity on Dhamma. So why not keep them in the, in the vein, in the reign of Dhamma by introducing Fang Pian Fa Men. Uh, Fang Pian means something that is very convenient, something that almost everyone can take it up and practice. So there came uh, many uh, practices and uh, uh, one of them is this uh, uh, school, Pure Land School, which developed into the Pure Land School. Uh, I think uh, uh, it is also very wholesome uh, what they are teaching and uh, what they are uh, practicing uh, has many elements of what the Buddha taught. But the Buddha himself said, if in any teaching and practice where it does not contain the four truths, chattariyari such when there is no truth to make people understand our nature of life is unsatisfactory, there is no clarity about the cause of unsatisfactoriness, there is no clarity about the freedom from this unsatisfactory nature, and there is no f clarity about what to practice, what is the path to practice to free ourselves from this unsatisfactory nature of life, then we cannot be free, we cannot be liberated. We can be more tranquil, we can be more wholesome, we can be more focused, but because it is not complete Dhamma, we cannot be completely free. Yeah, so it becomes a very convenient kind of practice a very wholesome way of practice. And if we just to bring that practice uh, to completion, then we have to clearly still uh, understand the four truths. Yeah, thank you. Okay, follow up on the question. Um, so, Brother Tan, if that's the case, can the Dhamma be present in other religions? The Buddha was asked this question by a group of Brahmins. He said that, well, it, it may be right that Arahants are also present in uh, other religions. Yeah, during Buddha's time, there were many religions. Uh, 62 of them were named and listed. But there were many others at the fringe which were not named and not listed. So other uh, practitioners were saying, well, not only in your teaching there is liberation, right? In other teachings also, there could be saints and arahants and Buddhas. Then the Buddha said, Akase padang nati samano nati bahire. He said, 
outside of the dispensation where you cannot find the four truths, then there will not be liberated beings. So the Buddha answered in that way. So whichever religion that has a clear explanation of the four truths so that the practitioners can realize the four truths for themselves, then there is the possibility of liberation. If there is no such clarity, then there is no such realization. Then there are no arahants outside this dispensation. That's what the Buddha answered. Thank you, Brother Dan. So, so, Sister Sylvia, so how do we now propagate the basic of the Buddha's Dhamma to the public, to the masses, so that the public will be at least be better informed? What we are doing here, law? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this question should have been directed to Brother Tan. He has a whole school propagating the Dhamma. <laughs> but let me just get a, take a step at it and then Brother Tan can explain further. Actually, the Dhamma is not that difficult. The Buddha was teaching about the nature of the, of mind, of the mind. Isn't it? The understanding of what Dhamma is, that there is Dukkha. What does it mean that there is Dukkha? It merely means that you experience, on a regular basis, sense of dissatisfaction. That's all. It's describing our state of mind. Nothing mysterious. We all experience moments of dissatisfaction. The regular person, when he experiences dissatisfaction, look for happiness. As Brother Tan said, we go in seek of happiness. By looking outwards, outwards, looking to fix our environment so that the environment is as we like it. And then we think we are happy. That method is wrong. Because the environment is never within our control. Because the environment is made out of many people. Even even when it is just your little home and you live alone, your aircon can die on you at the wrong time. Environment, the external environment is never the way to fix a problem. Problem can only be fixed when your own mind learns to tackle change. Impermanence is a given. At any one time you sit there, next moment is gone. This moment is gone, the next has arrived. The moment you're aware of the next moment, the next moment has arisen. In other words, impermanence is the nature of life. It's a given of life. And if you're trying to fix a problem so that you're always happy, then how do you fix impermanent? Can't be done, right? So the only way you can be happy, really be happy, is when you don't try to fix things. But our mind can't do that. It does not have that. The, the, the habit from the day you were born. Look, when you're a child and you onge onge, someone put a suitor into your mouth. Problem solved. You stop crying. Your baby cry, same thing. Onge onge, milk, suitor, whatever you have. Stop crying. That's how our mind works. There's a problem out there, fix it. But it's like the little boy who tries to stop the flood from overwhelming the, 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 the wall, holding back the, the water. You put the fingers in, but there's so many holes appearing in your life. Our life is full of events arising at astronomical speed. And you can't fix everything. So what do you fix? Inside, the mind. So the Eightfold Path is a method for you to learn how to change 
the way you see the world, change the way you react to the world, change the way you look at the world. As, as you slowly start to change your mental habits, then you learn to accept. Accept things as they arise. As they arise. Accept events, accept conditions, accept people. Accept people, conditions, and events for what they are. Right now, I say the word accept, and you will say in your mind, easier said than done. That's why you need the Eightfold Path. It's a method of training and rewiring. Without the Eightfold Path, it cannot be done. So let me repeat. Huh? Understand, the, 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 understand the nature of Dukkha. Why our mind has so much angst. Change the way the mind works. Angst can stop. Dukkha can stop. The Buddha walk around with a smile on his face and his calm demeanor because angst has stopped. And it can be done for all of us. So you ask me how to to explain the Dhamma and propagate the Dhamma, that's the easy part. Explaining what the teaching was is the easy part. Getting you to believe that the solution lies in the Eightfold Path and incorporating the Eightfold Path mental states into your regular mind, that's the difficult part. Ask you not to lose temper already very difficult. Oi, why you stay on my leg? What, what, stay, what, what, stay, what? <laughs> Ask, at that point, your, your, your people push you, you push back. Habits. You know what's the sad thing about these habits? All these habits are in your DNA, genetic code. You survive as a species, you survive. You survive, your DNA survive. Your ancestors survive and you survive, right? That DNA comes down to you. Because you fought well, your DNA are fighting genes. You survive because you know how to push back. Now in a society where you don't need to push back so much, the DNA doesn't know how to stop pushing. And so we end up reverting to very old habits. We have to change these habits. And you must believe that it can be done. Faith. Faith is faith in the Buddha's wisdom. Faith is faith that the Dhamma works. And faith is faith that you can do it. If you believe in the Buddha, and yeah, 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 I believe in the Dhamma, but I cannot, lah, I'm not so good. Finish. Lah. What faith are you talking about? No faith. That's it. Game's over. Okay? So to teach, to explain, to do it in forums like this, we have done it once, we can do it again. It's not a, that's, not the, that's not the difficult part. But the individual embracing, adopting, practicing, stay on course in daily life. When your wife nah, nah, nah at you, when your kid nah, 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 at you, and you still hold the line in your practice, ah, that's where the challenge really is hard. Okay. Brother Tan, do you want to share with us your experience and insights since Nalanda is such a successful yeah. society in Malaysia? How to propagate Dhamma. To the masses. Mm. I was asked this question about three days ago. Uh, how to propagate Dhamma in Thailand, of all places. <laughs> <laughs> I asked the interviewer, uh, for your own personal experience, what got you into the Dhamma? Because in Thailand, the majority of people uh, are Buddhist but may not know much Dhamma. So uh, this person was very much into the practice, a very good practitioner, in fact a teacher. So I asked her, what got you into the Dhamma in the first place? She says, from young I ask myself, what's life? Why am I born? And uh, what's the purpose of life? And uh, what's the meaning? I said it was the same for me. And that got us both into the Dhamma. So today, if we know how to get people to ask very important questions, Buddhism would then have very relevant answers for them. 
We need teachers to explain clearly the Buddha's teaching and the Buddha's message. We need to develop their confidence in the teaching and in themselves being able to apply those teachings. It's not difficult, it's doable. So if they have that question, the right kind of question, and they meet with the right kind of resource person, the right kind of teacher that is able to explain in simple terms, in clarity, and they build their confidence in both the Dhamma and themselves, that I consider successful propagation of Dhamma. So any mechanism, including forums, including classes, including counselling, including one-to-one -one or certain retreats, that there are so many that Buddhist Fellowship Singapore has been organising. Year in, year out, we have many effective courses that are being organised by BF. These are the ways which the Dhamma can be made known to many more people. Yeah. Okay, is this Sylvia? Oh, before I forget, in case I get scolded. <laughs> if you're looking for the Dhamma, and you're Malaysian, you go Nalanda. If you're Singaporean, you can come to DFC, uh, Dhamma, Fellow, from, Dhamma Foundation course, organized by uh, BF. We, we are using BF premises to teach the Dhamma, and in a similar way, it's a structured course, and in the full course, we'll take you from conceptual knowledge to the meditation and the practice. But it's a full year, it's a 31 week, 30, 31 week course, 30 week course. So, sorry, I'm not good with mathematics. I asked the banker. <laughs> we, if you are really interested and you, you, you want to look for a place to, uh, learn the Dhamma and understand how it works, understand what, to, what you have to do, and learn how to cope with the mind, and better tame the mind, then join us. Malaysia, Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> Only Malaysia and Singapore. <laughs> okay, um, the next question is directed at Sister Sylvia Bay. How are we sure there is rebirth Why are you so curious? Huh? <laughs> you know, I find it rather intriguing that the average person, when they first ask about the Dhamma, they ask about this one. Very strong interest in rebirth. Did you know that the main teaching of the Buddha was not so much about rebirth? but it's really about the Four Noble Truths and Eightfold Paths. However, this notion of rebirth comes up because in the time of the Buddha, many people also ask about that. So you have to understand the historical context of this notion of rebirth. You either, look, this is just a simple thing. You either believe that when you die, game's over, or you die, and you, oh, that's a yum sing. <laughs> you die and his game's over, meaning you are worm food. Or you die and there will be an arising. And in this arising, two version. You arise after the body is dead and you live forever. Or you arise after the body is dead, but you continue the cycle of change. So the individual being scared of death and wonder what happens will invariably ask this question. Do you accept that you die and become worm food or you die and you come again? That's all. Do I believe in rebirth is the question, right? Yes, I do. That's me. But you, whatever that I say to you, however I try to convince you, it's irrelevant. You, you haven't seen it for yourself. And the nature of the Dhamma is one sees for oneself, right? I can offer just a small segment of why I believe in rebirth, but I believe in rebirth within this life. Next life will take care of itself for me. Just take care of itself. I believe in rebirth this life. Every moment that I live, a part of me has died. 
And as long as I live on, every moment for me is a rebirth. And it is really the individual, individual who must ask himself or herself, you have you have another chance of life right now. And in all your chances of rebirth life right now, what do you want to spend it on? Do you want to spend it being angry? Being agitated? Getting perplexed? Getting caught up? Or do you want to spend each moment of becoming peaceful, joyous, happy, confident, spiritually alive, meaning in life. You haven't finished this life. Why worry about the next? You haven't lived this life. Why ask about next? So this is something, to me, it matters more. I live this life to the best of my ability. If there is another becoming, so be it. If there is no more becoming, and this is what is taught, Kalama Sutta, if there were no more becoming, so be it, it's okay. At least in this life, I have been happy, I have love, people love me, I have opportunities to do good and derive meaning from the activities that I do. Good enough. I don't want to spend my life pondering about the what ifs. As Brother Tan said earlier, by the time you finish pondering, you're dead. Then you will experience rebirth. <laughs> The version, the version that we are all, that some of us are caught up with. Okay? Yeah, and remember the Buddha said that even if you don't believe in the next life, the Dhamma can help you to be happy and contented in this very lifetime. And if there's the next life, yes, we've done something good, and our next life take care of. I think that's a very beautiful proposition. Okay, now we come to our last question. Uh because I try to see which are the interesting question. Okay, because we're talking about Buddhism is for, it's a 21st century choice. So the question is, how can Buddhists be socially engaged to help the marginalized community? Example, those who are poor or the LGBT community. How can, how can we as Buddhists help? It's for both speakers. <laughs> Buddhists can help everyone. Marginalized people suffer. Unmarginalized people suffer. Yeah. Minority people suffer. Majority people suffer. So Buddhism is the medicine for suffering. It's the solution for our dukkha. So it's relevant for everyone. So as uh, people uh, who are co-sufferers, when we look at other people suffering, the intention and the thought that we have should be, how can I live in such a way or say certain words or do certain actions that help them live less of a suffering life? So helping ourselves and helping others, there is actually no discrimination and no boundary. So this is what Dhamma practice is about. So Buddhists uh, can be socially engaged uh, and helping people, helping ourselves with the Dhamma. Yeah. So this is uh, my, my take. So Sylvia, last message. Good point, good point. <laughs> I will just tell one story, and it just struck me as I was sitting down here listening to Brother Tan. You know the story of Angulimala, right? That after he became a monk, not, not when he was in his previous life, after he became a monk, and he came across a woman who was in labor, 
And this poor woman was really in terrible pain. It was a hard labor. Angulimala went back to the Buddha and said, how, do, how can I help? Something's happening, I, 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 how can I help? This is a monk, a monk who saw for himself a woman in labor. And she had no one. She, he went and asked for help. And the Buddha said, tell, say, the, man, the, the, the mantra, <laughs> the mantra, that ever since, sorry, in my life, I've never done wrong. And then Angulima said, wait, 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 cannot say like that. Because last time, uh, I do a lot of wrong, kill a lot of people. Buddha said, okay, okay. Say, ever since I took on this role, I have never hurt another. I've never done wrong. And by this truth, may you be well and happy. And it worked. I mean, after some time, you know, giving allowance for nature to take its course, it worked. Mother and child were safe. The moral of the story, the point of the story, is that as Buddhists, as disciples of the Buddha, if we were to see everyone as no different from us, when we identify, when we embrace each other, then we must feel their pain as we feel ours. Very often, we don't chip in because we are caught up in us. My interests, my concerns, my free time, my money, my loved one being too tired, my loved one is working so hard to save the world, ayo. It's about me, my, and I. If you are truly disciples of the Buddha, then you learn to identify with others and see yourself as no more than just another. You will help. You don't think too much, you just do. And you're fine. And you should do. And you should do. Look, in our teaching, walking in the footstep of our teacher, you think about it. He went out and he retrieved someone who was a serial killer because he knew this guy, he could understand and he could be helped. Of course, he will have to bear the karma of the stain of the mind and all, but it's okay. He can be helped. So he went, he made no judgment. He made he made no judgment about someone who break the first precept. Not one time, not two times. How many times? Don't know lah, many times. According to record, 999, right? <laughs> but we know it cannot be lah, just a lot of time. You ask me, would the Buddha make judgment on this and that, minorities and LGBT and so on? You tell me. Know the Buddha for yourself, and you tell me, will he make, make judgment? If he does not, why do we do that? If, if he did not, if he doesn't, if he did not, why do we do that? We won't do that. <laughs> okay, time's up. <laughs> Please, yeah. Abaratan. Yeah. I'd like to add something to it. Sometimes, we have to see uh, suffering beings with a lot of empathy. The Buddha said, Atanang upamang katua na hanea nagatai. If compare this person, this person going through so much suffering, compare this person to ourselves. Do we enjoy going through the same kind of suffering? If we don't, then don't wish that person continuous suffering. But at the same time, if we cannot do anything to relieve their suffering, at least don't add to it. Have more empathy. Yeah. So the message of the Buddha is this, and it is still relevant for 21st century or beyond. Going back to the warring states when Buddhism spread across China, it went into the Han Dynasty, but during warring states, great Indian teachers have begun to go into China to teach meditation, Chan. 
the king in China asked one of the Indian masters and said, so you are the famous one. So let me ask you, I have been doing a lot of merits. I've done a lot of good. And the teacher asked, how did you do good? I built temples, monasteries, and pagodas all over my kingdom. Tell me, how much merits have I earned if I had built so many pagodas? Then the Dhamma teacher said, not much. Not much. If I double it, how much more would I make? Masiboche. <laughs> also not much. Then he said, how can? I thought your religion talked about doing good. He said, that is not what the Buddha taught. What did the Buddha say? He said, Sarva papasa karanang kushala shaupasampada. Shachita pariyot panang etang buddha na shashna. Translated to Singaporean. <laughs> Avoid doing unwholesome deeds. Stop the evil within. We have evil in our intentions, our thoughts, our speech, our actions, our lifestyle. Evil in creating harm and hurt to others and also to ourselves. Stop doing that. Kusala sa upasampada. Then only is meaningful if you cultivate goodness like charity, restraint, morality, and many other kinds of kindness and compassionate acts. You do that. Then go further. Sajita pariyodapana. Individually purify our own minds. Not just do good and not just being good because there are latent defilements within all our minds. Purify those minds. That is the real teaching of the Buddha. If we want to know what is really good, then that teaching of the Buddha, that message, is the good thing. So in life, yeah, don't just go around doing good or think that we are good. But in a very sure way, confident way, pragmatic way, and spiritual way, in the way that is wise, purify the mind so that we not only become happier, we also become much better. So in this wonderful Teochew Association, I want to end with Teochew Kut. Tsonang Meng Meng Pe Pe. Thank you so much for the wonderful discussion. <laughs>